Welcome Grade 11 learners to another installment of Life Sciences. Well, I hope you guys are preparing for your exams. Today we're looking at cellular respiration and we're going to have an overview of the process. We're going to answer some questions. I'm going to get you guys involved. And we're going to link this to the concept of how food that we've looked at during nutrition has now been utilized at a cellular level to produce the energy that is required by the body for energy in terms of carrying out the physiological processes. So I think in terms of understanding the context of where we are, remember that we've finished with nutrition, we looked at the fate of food and how that undergoes a process of digestion, we looked at what happens at an assimilation perspective. Today we're looking at in terms of the context of what happens to all that food, especially the nutrients in terms of glucose at a cellular level to produce the energy that the body needs. So let's get straight into cellular respiration and let's look at an overview of the process and answer some questions. So when we look at cellular respiration guys we've got to put this into the context of at a cellular level what is happening. So if you could recollect from grade 10 we spoke about uh, organelles in the in the cell and one of the organelles that we I'm sure that struck out and that you remember clearly was the mitochondria and here we've illustrated the mitochondria again a unique shape characterized by those folds on the inner surface of the membrane and we call those folds the cristae and it has a matrix and this is essentially the organelle which is the powerhouse of the cell which drives the cell in terms of the energy producing organelle. Okay, what is very important for us to understand later on is we've got to look at cellular respiration in different stages and essentially this diagram here illustrates the various stages in which energy is produced in the cell. But we're going to focus on that as we get into the details of the section. Very important. Let's look at some of the important terminology before we start the topic so that we can sort of unpack these terms when we go through it. So I did speak to you about the mitochondria and I said that was the organelle in which the cell produces the energy and that energy is produced in a form called ATP which we're going to look at. We also know that in the mitochondria there are folds called cristae and it has a medium called the matrix in which all the enzymatic reactions occur. What we've got to look at is the molecule ADP and how that is converted to ADP in, a, in one of the stages known as oxidative phosphorylation where phosphate is added to ADP to give you adenosine triphosphate. Cool. During the course of this lesson we're going to be looking at what aerobic respiration is. We will discuss briefly what anaerobic respiration but we're going to compare these two next week. We're going to look at the stages of respiration which are described as glycolysis, Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation and we're going to discuss an overview of what mitochondrial DNA is at some point in the lesson in regards to how that can be used to work out DNA ancestry. Let's get to some key concepts on this topic. So where does cellular energy come from guys and that's very important for us to understand. Where does the energy we produce in our body comes from? come from. So we know that autotrophs use energy from the sun to produce food and we refer to that process as photosynthesis. We get some chemosynthetic bacteria that do produce energy but essentially most of our energy comes from food that has been produced by the autotrophic organisms or organisms that have consumed autotrophs. So by that I mean some of the carnivores or some of the omnivores. They will consume some of the primary producers and we in turn get our energy by eating um, some of the producers. And then finally that food in the body is broken up to produce adenosine triphosphate which is commonly known as ATP. So essentially what we're looking at, at is the process and the interdependence of photosynthesis and respiration in terms of what is produced by photosynthesis that is used in respiration and what is produced in respiration that could be used to support photosynthesis. So that's quite an interesting association that we need to uh, unpack as we get through the topic. Another very important structure that we need to look in our key concepts is the structure of the mitochondria. And very important for us to look when we look at the mitochondria is to understand that the mitochondria is a, is a, is a double membrane structure as we clearly see this. It is, it's got a large number of folds on the inner surface area which we call cristae. And these cristae actually increase the surface area for the, on the internal surface to, for enzyme activity. We also see some starch granules which are present in the mitochondria. We also know that there are ribosomes present in the mitochondria. 
So your apologies, these are not starch granules. These are mitochond these are granules that contain enzymes, and these enzymes are often produced by what we call the ribosomes. So we're looking at ribosomes and how they carry out an important part of protein synthesis. What is not illustrated in this diagram is the mitochondrial DNA, and that is DNA that is present in the mitochondria and that it has a very important function in controlling the um, the the controlling the production of enzymes in the mitochondria. So as we discussed, the mitochondria has two membranes. It's got an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And these membranes essentially will be important in controlling the entry of substances into the structure. Between the membrane is a space, and that space is folded, and we refer to that those folds as cristae. And the space in encloses what we have, a medium called the matrix, in which the cellular processes or the processes within the organelle occur. The cristae essentially will increase the surface area on the inner membrane so to increase the ATP production. So we want to maximize the process of energy production and the best way to do that is to increase the internal surface folds by cristae so that we maximize the potential of the mitochondria to produce energy. Let's look at the key concept around what aerobic respiration is. What we need to understand is that respiration is a process of utilizing oxygen and producing energy. So aerobic respiration occurs when glucose is broken down in the presence of oxygen. And that's fundamentally important to understand in terms of aerobic respiration where oxygen is needed. Guys, we will look at anaerobic respiration, which is respiration that occurs in the absence of oxygen. A lot of energy, many ATP molecules, is produced in this process. And so we know that the more oxygen you have in your body, the more energetic you feel. And the relationship between that is that oxygen is the molecule that fuels the process of breaking down sugar or glucose in the body. So when we look at respiration in, in a chemical equation, we can summarize it as follows. So we know that we need glucose molecule, and respiration, when it's anaerobic, requires oxygen, and that produces energy, and that is 38 molecules of ATP. And we'll look at that. That's the sum of 38 molecules of ATP from one single glucose molecule. And that also produces water as a waste product, as well as carbon dioxide, which are released. So it's very important for us to remember that a glucose molecule produces 38 molecules of ATP, and this is what the body needs to carry out processes internally. This is a diagram that just illustrates the process of breathing. And guys, if we associate, if we differentiate the process of breathing and respiration, breathing in this case refers to the manner in which oxygen is taken into the body and how carbon dioxide is released. And we refer to that process as gases exchange, uh, sorry, breathing at a pro at, in terms of gases being exchanged from the lungs to the external surface. However, cellular respiration occurs at a cellular level in the mitochondria where oxygen is used by the mitochondria to break down sugar and to produce energy. So you should be able to differentiate between breathing and cellular respiration. And what we also have, another term which I've accidentally mentioned earlier on, gaseous exchange, and that is essentially describing the exchange of gases, but this is at a level where you have cells in the body and you have blood capillaries that carry the oxygen. So it is the exchange and the diffusion of the gases into and out of the capillaries to, in, to the cells where the oxygen is needed. So essentially we're referring to breathing, respiration and gases exchange as three very important processes. Okay, so we're going to look at an overview of the stages of respiration. And we're going to look at these key stages and understand exactly what happens in them before we get to some questions. So there are three stages in anaerobic respiration, as I've mentioned. The first stage is called glycolysis or glycolysis. The second stage is known as Krebs cycle. And the third, which kind of has a comp sort of a complex name, oxidative phosphorylation. And I'll describe more or less what happens in this stage. So let's look at stage one. Let's have an overview of this process. Glycolysis refers to the step in which glucose is splitting up into two molecules. So it's the splitting up of glucose. So 
When we split up glucose, we refer to that process as glycolysis. This occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. So yet, not in the mitochondria. Outside the mitochondria, we know that we've got cytoplasm. And that means that the splitting up, the first stage of respiration, cellular respiration, occurs in the cytoplasm where the glucose is split up. The glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid molecules, and these are two pyruvic acid molecules, and energy-rich hydrogen atoms are given off. So what we see is that the glucose molecule breaks up into two pyruvic acid molecules, and in that process, it produces energy-rich hydrogen atoms, which will then be utilized in the next two stages. So the hydrogen atoms then move into the mitochondria and will be used in the third step known as oxidative phosphorylation. So that energy will be used in oxidative phosphorylation. And the two, and in this process, there are two molecules of ATP that are produced. The pyruvic acid then goes into the next stage of the Krebs cycle, in which that will further undergo, that will undergo further chemical breakdown of those pyruvic acid molecules. So what you've got to remember is that there's pyruvic acid that's produced, two hydrogen atoms that are produced, and then we've got those ATP, two ATP molecules that are produced during this process of glycolysis. We're going to get into the next step, which is called the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle essentially is also known as the citric cycle. And here we see the Krebs cycle breaking down pyruvic acid completely into energy-rich hydrogen and carbon, and carbon dioxide. So what we see here is a cyclic breakdown of pyruvic acid. As it enters, it's broken up into acetyl-CoA. You really don't need to know that detail, but it undergoes a series of chemical reactions in which it is broken up further to produce ATP and what we see is carbon dioxide gas, which is given off as a waste product. Okay, so throughout this process, we're seeing carbon dioxide being produced, we're seeing carbon dioxide being released, and we're seeing ATP, which is being produced during this stage. What happens to all of these? So the hydrogen will be used in oxidative phosphorylation, so we see that the hydrogen is sent to the next stage, and the carbon dioxide will be something that you will exhale to get rid of from your, from your body. So essentially, we're looking at the Krebs cycle as a stage in which pyruvic acid is broken down in a series of cyclic steps to release hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And that hydrogen then goes into the next stage uh, through a molecule known as NADH, and it's used in oxidative phosphorylation. Let's get straight into oxidative phosphorylation before we have a break. Oxidative phosphorylation, the word phosphorylation simply means the addition of a phosphate molecule. And how does that happen? So if you guys remember that we've got ADP, and ADP needs to be converted to ATP. And the word ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate. So here we've got a molecule that has two, uh, two phosphate molecules, so adenosine diphosphate. When we add phosphate, during phosphorylation, it becomes adenosine triphosphate. So here's a, a molecule that has three phosphate molecules, highly energized, and this is what is going to produce, uh, give the necessary energy for the metabolic reactions to occur. So again, this takes energy from the energy-rich hydrogen atoms that have been produced during oxidate, during the Krebs cycle, as well as during the initial glycolysis state. So it uses those energy-rich hydrogen atoms. In a series of steps, the energy is depleted from those energy-rich hydrogen atoms. So hydrogen, guys, is highly energized and through a series of cyclic steps gradually starts losing its energy in what we call the energy transfer system to eventually become de-energized. That de-energized or depleted hydrogen combines with oxygen and what we know to form is water as a waste product. So to make water. This either is exhaled or the water vapor is excreted by the kidneys. So we're seeing at the end of this step, we find that there are 36 molecules of ATP that are produced, and we also have the two molecules that have been produced in glycolysis, and they collectively form 38 molecules of ATP from a single glucose molecule. So that was an overview of the process. What we're going to get into next is some questions which I want to engage with you, but I think that you guys have done well, you've been focused, 
I think you deserve a break, so we'll have a short break. And when we get back, we'll get to some questions. Welcome back, guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an overview of what we've done in the first segment, and then we're going to tackle some questions. I want you guys to get into some groups so that you can have a good discussion about what we're doing, and then answer some, those, answer some of those questions together. So let's look at the overview of what we've done. So what we're looking at is we're looking at the overview of the stages in cellular respiration. The first stage that we looked at and discussed early on in the session was glycolysis. And we said that glycolysis uses glucose, it occurs in the cytoplasm and it splits up to form pyruvic acid. That pyruvic acid then enters the mitochondria. But during glycolysis, we have ATP produced, and these are two molecules of ATP which then are then retained in the energy in the cell to be used for cellular processes. However, we have energy rich hydrogen atoms which is then sent into the third stage, which we know as oxidative phosphorylation. So we produce pyruvic acid which goes into the Krebs cycle and we produce ATP which is then goes into the reservoir of energy the cell needs but the energy rich hydrogen atoms that are released from the glycolysis or the breakdown of glucose is used in oxidative phosphorylation. Let's see, the second step that we looked at was the Krebs cycle and these two stages, both the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation both occur in the mitochondria. So in the mitochondria, we find that the Krebs cycle will process pyruvic acid. And by the way, there are two pyruvic acid molecules that undergo two separate Krebs cycle pathways. And each one will undergo a series of de uh, breakdown where energy-rich hydrogen atoms are produced, releasing um, your, your carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, as well as producing highly energized energy-rich hydrogen atoms. The energy-rich hydrogen atoms then are carried into the stage known as oxidative phosphorylation. And during this stage, the energy from the hydrogen atoms are used to add a phosphate molecule to ADP to form ATP. And hence, we have 38 molecules of ATP being produced. And during that process, the, the energy from the hydrogen atom decreases and the hydrogens become de-energized. And those de-energized hydrogen atoms combine with oxygen and they form H2O and they either exhaled or they go um, and they exhaled. Cool, so that's the overview. So what we're going to get straight into, we're going get to get into some questions. I'm going to read through these questions, put them up and give you two minutes to work through them and then when we get back after that, we're going to engage with you and your friends to see what answers you've come up with. So let's look at activity one. The diagram below shows a simplified view of the relationship between two biochemical processes. Here we're seeing process one and process two, and it shows a relationship between these two processes. Let's look at the diagrams. Let's study them. Here we see a glucose molecule. We see a structure here with a lot of folds. I'm not giving away any clues yet. And here we see an oval structure with structures which appear to be, I'm just going to enhance the image for you, sort of stacked one on top of each other. And that should be a good clue for you in terms of what that organelle represents. Here we're seeing arrows. Here we're seeing an X being released from this organelle traveling through to the process 1. And we're seeing the glucose from process 2 being utilized in process 1. Let's get to the questions. I'll give you an opportunity to work through these and then we can get back and look at some solutions. So question number 1.1. Identify process 1. So here we've got to identify process 1. Identify process 2. And number 1.3. Name the organelles in which process 1 and 2 occur respectively. So guys, two minutes. Have a quick discussion. Look at these organelles. Try and identify the different processes and what these organelles represent. And I'll see you at the end of two minutes.
Welcome back. So, what was the discussion? Did you guys try and figure out those organelles? I'm sure it was quite easy. I did give you some pointers initially. Let's look at the solutions. So, I know that initially when I looked at the structure, I gave you some clues around what they look like. Let's look at organelle 1. What was that organelle looking like first? So, guys, if you look at the inside folds, and this is synonymous with the structure which we know, uh, which we know as the mitochondrion. So, that's the mitochondria. Okay, and here we have this oval structure which we know as the chloroplast. And we can see clearly what is occurring here. We're seeing light energy being utilized by this organelle, something occurring and producing glucose. So that should have helped you to identify the parts, the organelles. What is the process that is occurring in number one? Guys, we can clearly see here energy being produced and hence that will be respiration. And, the and what should help you would be that you can clearly see the production of ATP in this organelle. Cool. Next question. Identify process 2. And when we look at process 2, guys, we looked at process 2, and here we can see energy, light energy being utilized, and that energy being converted into glucose. And we know that that process 2 is a process which we have done in the past, which is known as photosynthesis. Okay, so that's photosynthesis. 1.3. Name the organelle in which processes 1 and 2 occur respectively, and we just, we've just done that. So number 1, it occurs in the mitochondria, and process number 2, which is photosynthesis, occurs in the chloroplast. So quite easy, accessible questions for you to have got in terms of um, solutions too. So let's move on to the next set of questions based on these organelles. So again, so here we've got to look at 1.4. Provide labels for parts labeled A. B, which points to this area here, C, which points to the stack of, that's there, so that's essentially C, and D, which points to the inner me medium in which the chloroplast contents float. And then we've got to identify guesses X and Y. So quite a nice question. Again, I think I'll give you guys a minute, have a quick discussion, not that difficult. So at the, at the tail end of a minute, we will look at the solution. So a minute, quick discussion, let's come back with some answers. I can hear some of you guys telling me that, whoa, these are just teasers. There must be something more difficult than this. And I guess there are. So let's look at some, these are some basic questions. I'm going to throw in some few challenging questions in the next question, but I just wanted to get a feel of this so that you could apply what you've already learned and assimilate it to the process here. So let's look at these answers. So very quickly, I'm sure you had quite a quick discussion with your folks around you. So let's look at this. So we had to provide labels for parts A, B, C, and D. In part A, if you look at these folds, guys, they refer to as the cristae, and the cristae refer to the, the folds that you see on the inner lining, and then B referred to the medium that the internal contents of the mitochondria contain, and that's the matrix. And when we look at C, C referred to those stacks of coins, which we refer to as the granum, and it's synonymously unique to the chloroplast, and then the medium in which all of that floats is known as the stroma. So the, the mitochondria has the matrix and the chloroplast has the stroma as the internal medium. Okay, 1.5 was where you had to identify the gases X and Y. So if we go back to this diagram, guys, let's look at gases X and Y and look at the relationship between X and Y. So here we're seeing, if we look at Y, Y is being utilized in this process 
X is being produced in this process and it is utilized by process 1. So what is it that is produced in photosynthesis that is utilized in respiration? So what is produced in photosynthesis? We know that oxygen is produced in photosynthesis and that oxygen is utilized in the process of aerobic respiration and we can clearly see that. And part of that oxygen that is produced is then utilized in the process and we have at the end we have carbon dioxide which is released and that carbon dioxide is gas Y and we know that carbon dioxide is utilized in, in photosynthesis and along with the energy from the sun can be put together to give you glucose molecules. So the gases X was glucose, uh, sorry X was, why am I saying glucose? Glucose is not a gas. X was oxygen and Y was carbon dioxide. So quite a nice question for us to have looked at and try to associate what we've already understood by the process. The next question is, here we've got to tabulate four differences between process one. So essentially what we're looking at is tabulating, which means drawing a table to differentiate the processes one and two, which is photosynthesis and respiration. So I've drawn a table and we're going to very quickly look at this and we're going to look at the responses and the differences. Guys, what is important to remember that a, a tabulation means that you've got to draw a table and that table needs to be a neat table and generally should have a heading, in this case the process of respiration and photosynthesis. It will be differences between um, photosynthesis and respiration and we've got to make sure that the differences are, uh, are a mutual uh, are in proportion or in, rel in relation to each other. So by that I mean let's look at what we're talking about. So here we're looking at the processes we're describing in relation to each other, how they're different. So respiration we know occurs both during the day and the night. However, photosynthesis can occur, occurs generally during the day. And I did at my, some point mention that there are certain plants that can photosynthesize synthesize at night, but they would require some of the products during photosynthesis during the day to be able to do some photosynthesis at night. So we're saying that it occurs both during the day and night whereas photosynthesis occurs only at in during the day. What is also produced during photosynthesis respiration is carbon dioxide and it absorbs oxygen whereas when we look at respiration we find the opposite. So it produces oxygen and it absorbs carbon dioxide. And if we can put these two processes together in a mutual manner they'll be able to sustain themselves and at some point during photosynthesis I mentioned the point of the term compensation point and that refers to the amount of um, oxygen that is produced during photosynthesis and how that was utilized during respiration and the amount of carbon dioxide produced during respiration being utilized by the plant. When that point is established where the amounts of gases produced are equal by these two organelles we refer to that process as the compensation point. Okay, but that's over and above the differences that we need to discuss. What is important is that respiration is a catabolic process whereas photosynthesis is an anabolic process. So what do I mean by this? Both these are metabolic processes but the catabolic process, if you think of respiration, it is a breaking down process. We're taking glucose and we're breaking it down into ATP. So here we break down, it breaks down a complex organic molecule into a simple ATP molecule releasing energy and it produces hydrogen which is then combining with water uh, with oxygen to form water but we also know that photosynthesis is a building up process so we're taking the building blocks we're taking carbon dioxide we're taking energy from the sun and we're using um, uh, water to produce C6H12O6 which is the opposite of what respiration does so here we find that it's one is a catabolic process while the other is an anabolic process. Another difference would be that respiration produces water and photosynthesis requires the water. Um, something else is that the primary product is energy rich ATP during respiration. However, during photosynthesis we find that there is glucose or carbohydrates which is the primary product that is produced. So essentially what we've looked at is we've looked at the differences between the two processes. What I think we should do is go into a little break and then when we get back, we're going to look at some questions that deal with the stages of respiration and try and understand exactly what happens in that process. So a short break, guys. Stretch a bit and then we get into the last segment with some nice questions to tackle. 
Welcome back. Guys, we're looking at the last segment. So we're going to tackle some questions that are a bit more challenging, but I'm sure you guys are going to cope. It's very important to contextualize these questions in the, con in the context of what we've done already. So let's look at this diagram. The stages in cellular respiration are shown in the diagram below. What we're seeing here is that we're seeing a series of stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three, which you guys would now be able to quickly identify. And we're seeing a compound A, which is an organic compound, being converted to compound E. And then that produces molecule B, which then goes into the stage two. And then during stage two, there are more molecules B being produced, as well as a molecule D, and then further undergoing a series of reactions known as the energy carrier system to finally give you molecules C and F. And essentially, I think this question is going to be based on identifying the stages, identifying what these molecules are. So let's look at the questions. I'll give you an opportunity to engage with these questions, and then I'm going to flash back to the diagram so that you can work with some of these questions. Okay, so let's see. So you've got to identify stage one, stage two, organic compound A, the energy-rich atoms, which we know as B, energy-rich substance C, gas D, organic compound E, and the byproduct F. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two minutes to put in as much as you can. I'm going to flip back to the diagram, and at the end of a minute, flip back to the stages so that you might be able to use both to complete both the stages and the diagram. So two minutes, guys. We're going to reflect on these questions. Go to the diagram, fill in as much as you can, and then we tackle these answers. So let's look at some of these answers. Let's try and fill in as much as we can. When you get a question of this nature, try and put in as much information on this and then attempt to read the questions and see. So guys, looking at this, we know that stage one is the first stage and we know that in this stage, we find that the glucose is split up. So it's glycolysis and we refer to that as the splitting up the glucose molecule. So this organic compound A is definitely going to be glucose. And that glucose molecule is going to be split up into an organic molecule E, which we know as the pyruvic molecule, pyruvic acid. And that further undergoes the next stage, which is stage 2, which we called the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle is basically a series of events which under, where, in which the pyruvic acid further undergoes, excuse me, undergoes further breakdown. And both of these produce... Firstly, you're going to get the hydrogen atoms that are coming here, 
and th these further produce more hydrogen atoms and we also get what we call here the carbon dioxide that is produced. Okay. What we see in the last step is we're seeing energy rich carrier system which is the release of energy from the hydrogen atoms, the production of ATP which is the final molecule, AT, sorry, APT, let me just erase that again. So that's, we said it's ATP, ATP, and we see that this is when the de-energized um, hydrogen atoms combine with oxygen to form H2O. So essentially stage 3 will be the last stage where the phosphate is added, and that stage is known as oxidative phosphorylation and that's the addition of phosphorylation and the addition of the phosphate to ADP to give you ATP and that is with the help and from the energy in the hydrogen atoms so let's look at those answers I was able to put these answers down so that we can quickly have a check of our answers so we said stage one was glycolysis stage two was the Krebs cycle and the organic compound A was glucose, and that is the organic compound that is the energy that is going to be used to release um, two molecules of ATP and produce pyruvic acid. Energy rich atoms B was, guys, if we go back to let's see what energy rich atom B was. Energy rich atom B was the hydrogen, and we know that the hydrogen comes down from the, the Krebs cycle as well as the glycolysis to be used in oxidative phosphorylation. Energy rich substance C. Substance C, guys, was the ATP molecule, which is the final energy carrier molecule that we need. The gas D was, if we look at gas D, let me just click on that again. Let me get to my pen. Let's try this again. Was carbon dioxide. And the organic compound E, we said, was pyruvic acid, which was what is, happens to glucose when it's split up. And then the byproduct F was what happens to the de-energized hydrogen atoms. And we said that that combines with water, with oxygen, to form water. So quite a nice question to engage with. Let's look at some more questions on this diagram and see if we can answer them together. In which organelle do stages 2 and 3 occur? So in which organelle do stages 2 and 3? And if we look at stages 2 and 3, guys, stages 2 and 3 refer to the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And both of these occur in the mitochondria and they occur in the matrix of the mitochondria. So it occurs in the mitochondria, unlike glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm. So it occurs in the mitochondria. Where does stage one occur? So in order for us to understand this, we've got to know that stage one is glycolysis, and that would occur in the cytoplasm of the cell in which the glucose is broken down. 2.4. State what happens to the compound E if no oxygen is present. So compound E, guys, if we go back to compound E, let's do a very quick recap of compound E. So compound E was, let me just go down, compound E was pyruvic acid. So guys, this is on the, on the tail end of what we're going to be doing next week. And the pyruvic acid, when there is, when there is no oxygen, you find that the cell will undergo anaerobic respiration. And during anaerobic respiration, it will use the pyruvic acid molecule and it will produce in plant cells. They produce, uh, let's go with this, it's called alcoholic fermentation. So it's going to be alcohol or ethanol. And in an animal cell, it will undergo a process known as lactic acid fermentation. So it will produce lactic acid in a animal cell. So that is what we're going to be doing next week. But I just thought that I could put that in to stretch you a bit and give you an indication of what happens when there is no oxygen at that process of glycolysis. Okay, so I have put in the answers. We can very quickly go through those solutions very quickly. So in which organelle do they occur? So we said that it occurs in the mitochondria. And then in where in the cell does stages 1 occur? We said that it occurs in the cytoplasm. And then finally, the last answer was we said that it's converted either into lactic acid in an animal cell or alcohol in plant cells. And that's got to do with alcoholic fermentation as well as anaerobic respiration in the buildup of lactic acid. But more about that in our next episode.
I've got quite an interesting experiment here that I'd like to start and get through with you guys. The diagram below represents the apparatus that was used in a practical investigation. After a period of 24 hours, red hydrogen carbonate indicator was added to each test tube. So red carbon hydrogenate, hydrogen, sorry, let me repeat that again. Red hydrogen carbonate turns yellow in the presence of carbon dioxide. So essentially what red hydrogen carbonate, it is, it is an indicator. And this indicator is used to identify the presence of carbon dioxide. So when it turns red, when it turns yellow, it will confirm the presence of carbon dioxide. If it remains red, it indicates the absence. So what happens is that we've got three test tubes illustrated below. A test tube that, are, that it contains water only. Here we've got a hydrophyte, which is a plant, or an aquatic plant, in test tube B. And in test tube C, we have a micro, we have an, we have a, uh, an organism known as the snail. And we know that A and C, or plants A, B, and C, are all kept in a dark cupboard and allowed to undergo a natural process of either respiration or photosynthesis. But we're not too sure. We will discuss those options when we get to the questions. 3.1. Tabulate the results in terms of the color that may be observed in test tubes A, B, and C, respectively. And this is quite a difficult question, especially not having done the experiment. But I want to take you through the answers and explain to you exactly how would you how you would do this. So the key to this is that understanding that these test tubes are kept in darkness, which means that one photosynthesis will not occur. So I think here you're going to find that the water is present, no organisms in it. Here you're finding a plant in a test tube. The question is, does photosynthesis occur or does respiration occur? And we know that there's going to be no photosynthesis, but we will find that plants do respire. And here we find a snail, and that snail is kept in a dark room as well and will definitely photosynthesize, sorry, will definitely respire or undergo respiration and produce carbon dioxide. So eventually what will happen is that the color of the test tubes will change based on the presence of carbon dioxide. So yes, we're going to get carbon dioxide being produced in that test tube there. The question is, will it be produced here? Do plants undergo respiration? The answer is yes. So yes, we will find carbon dioxide in that as a result of the mitochondria undergoing respiration, where it would have used the glucose produced during photosynthesis and converted that into um, energy, and in that process produced carbon dioxide as a waste product. So the answer to that would be, let's see. So I've tabulated that in here. Let me very quickly click my answers. So A is going to be red, yellow, yellow. And the reason why red changes to yellow is that in the presence of carbon dioxide, we know that the carbonate solution turns from red to yellow, and hence the presence of carbon dioxide, the presence of carbon dioxide can be confirmed. The next question would relate to the same experiment again. Let's look at it. what conclusion can be drawn from these results, and that is essentially a conclusion based on whether these plants are undergoing respiration in a dark room. 3.3 would be, what is the purpose of test tube A? And often this is an important question in any experiment. And 3.4, why were the test tubes kept in the dark? And that's quite an interesting twist to this experiment. Why would you want to keep the test tubes in dark? Knowing that you've got a plant, that's quite an interesting twist in this question. So let's get to these answers. So if you go back to this, so we've got this three test tubes kept in the darkness. The question is, what is the function of test tube A or the significance of this in this in the context of this experiment. Let's look at these answers. So what conclusion can be drawn from these results? And we know that we're looking at whether living organisms, namely the water plant and the snail, can release carbon dioxide during cellular respiration. In other words, to investigate if cellular respiration occurs in a plant as well as in a snail. So yes, it does occur. The next question. What is the purpose of test tube A? And guys, if you look at test tube A, test tube A was a test tube that had just water in it. There was nothing in it. There was no plant. There was neither a snail in it. So essentially, it was used as a control. And in this case, the control was used to verify that the organisms are responsible for the release of carbon dioxide in that test tube. Because when we looked at it, we were able to compare the test tube, which did not have anything, 
and we compared it to the two other test tubes that either had the plant or that had the snail. And we can conclusively say that it was not the water that caused the color change, but it was the presence of either the plant or the snail that caused the change. And that was essentially saying that the plant and the snail underwent or undergone of, uh, respiration to have made that change. And finally, the last question is, why were the test tubes kept in the dark? And this is quite an interesting question, guys, because if we were to keep the test tubes in light, we know that the plant in the presence of light will undergo photosynthesis and to some extent will be able to utilize some of that carbon dioxide. So if there was any respiration, the potential to detect carbon dioxide in that would have been negligible due to the plant being able to uh, photosynthesize. So the importance of keeping those test tubes in a dark room was to show that to prevent photosynthesis from occurring and hence to, to actually investigate one variable which was the presence of oxygen for respiration by those plants and thus producing carbon dioxide. One more question again related to this test tube. 3.5. Quite an interesting question. I don't think I'm going to get through this but I'm going to leave you with a thought and you can think about this in terms of when you reflect on this experiment. The question is describe the expected results that you are observations and give an explanation in each of the following situations. If such test tube B had a snail added to it and the test tube was placed in the light, what would happen? And essentially this is looking at taking the test tubes, placing them in light and putting a snail in it. Essentially what's going to happen is that the plant is going to photosynthesize, the snail is going to be able to use some of that oxygen that is produced during photosynthesis and carry out respiration. So I think it will undergo some kind of dynamic equilibrium of where it balances out with the presence of carbon dioxide being utilized by photosynthesis and I think that it's going to test negative. Guys you've worked well, stay focused, work smart, see you next week.